Uh, hello everyone, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. As Ben said, I, I'm James Quinn, uh, President-elect of IOSH, and I'd like, like to welcome you to the latest in our series of COVID-19 webinars. We launched these three weekly webinars at the start of April. Uh, this is the 16th in the series. They focus on sharing knowledge, experience, and expertise relevant to occupational safety and health, COVID-19, and creating and sustaining safe, healthy, and of course, resilient workplaces. This session, a really special session, examines our own professional community. It explores how taking on extra responsibility, demonstrating your skills, networking, and giving back to, by volunteering can develop your career as a world of what learns to cope with pandemics with, and their effects. IOSH, the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, it's a chartered body and the world's largest membership organisation for health and safety professionals. So what does belonging to this organisation signify? What does it mean to out of more than 48,000 members? As well as your dedication to the jobs you do, how can this network of demonstrating or developing, continuous and developing and sharing knowledge and expertise demonstrate all professionals' abilities and commitment? Well, I'm delighted as our first guest uh, to be joined today by two tremendous guests. In fact, Ria Sukanarin from Trinidad, treasurer of our Caribbean branch, and also communications lead for IOSH's logistics and retail group. Ria works for the United Independent Patrol and Marketing Company Limited, uh, and that, that company is in Trinidad, or Unipet as it's called. She will represent on how she invests in her career, in that development, and in, in the many ways that she does it including through volunteering for IOSH, which takes up a lot of her time. Our next panellist, Josh Huggins, is director of a leading specialist OSH recruitment firm, Principal People. Josh has also been a key driver for the Great Safety for Good initiative that IOSH supports, which showcases the significant proactive and preventive work that health and safety professionals do to protect and serve their communities and colleagues. In his presentation, Josh will update us on the state of the OSH recruitment market, and emerging challenges and prospects. He will give insights from the new series of Inside Safety Reports, published by Safety for Good and Principal People, featuring interviews with 30 OSH leaders and drawing on recent survey results. He will also give advice and help to improve your employability. Finally, <laughs> finally, I will reflect on my own career journey, how the knowledge and power skills I developed in the Army and the health and safety training experience gained in my last few years of service built a bridge towards my OSH career and introduced me to IOSH. And I'll be very clear here before I go on, without IOSH, I wouldn't be sitting here now talking to you as your future president. My IPD and my CPD, my volunteering, the active role I played in the OSH, IOSH community have all enhanced my career and helped me move forward. We want to hear from you too. So we'll be taking questions at the end of this session and we'll address as many as we can. Please submit them throughout the webinar. I want to emphasize that this and our other webinars are a platform to inform and engage with safety and health professionals and others responsible for safety and health at work. We want to support you with this regular platform for engagement, a two-way channel, giving you opportunity to share support and guide on this evolving issue, wherever you are, and whichever industry sector you work. We have a member of the IOSH team, Ben, who's taking care of the technical aspects today, as you've heard, and to help this run as smoothly as possible. The session is being recorded for future playback and sharing. So, with that, I'd now like to introduce Ria for our presentation. Ria, please turn on your video and start sharing your screen. Thank you all. Thank you for that introduction, Dean, and a warm welcome to our participants for joining in. My story begins after I completed my bachelor's degree in occupational safety and health. I remember being naive and enthusiastic, eager to plunge into this world of work. I assumed that I would immediately get a job in this profession after I graduated. The harsh reality was that this was not going to be easy. I applied for endless jobs. I received endless rejections and I even offered to work for no fee. Employers' preference um, at this time in this male-dominated field was that in order to get hired, 
the candidate must have had safety related experience. Fast forward four years later when I finally landed a job in a safety role. This was only because I was able to develop and hone my skills as a safety practitioner through volunteering. I volunteered my time with the Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society and the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management as an outreach volunteer. I, in this role, we offered aid in disaster relief and policy planning. I joined IOSH around this time to improve my employability and to expand my network. IOSH embodied my beliefs from being proactive and visibly demonstrating its intent to shape the future of safety and health. Soon thereafter, I was co-opted to the Caribbean branch um, on the executive committee as the communications coordinator. Um, being employed in the retail sector, I was affiliated with the retail and logistics group. And I used this opportunity to interact with other professionals in that sector to discuss challenges that were specific to the retail industry. Later on, I was appointed as the communications coordinator to the group, where my core role was on promoting the group's initiatives and sharing the ways of IOSH through social media. I was also involved in the IOSH focus group, which evaluated core functioning areas in branches and groups. The work I have done with IOSH has enabled me to grow professionally, gaining new experiences and insights. So the opportunities created through my demonstration of commitment to OSH are perfectly represented by IOSH's three aims that underpin its RIV 2022 strategy, enhance, collaborate, and influence. The most noteworthy opportunity was my participation in the promotion of the IOSH Week 2022 strategy. I have also had opportunities to enhance the profession by promoting positive perceptions about IOSH and developing competence and capability. My work with IOSH involved collaborating with like-minded professionals to support a shared vision of a safe and healthy week. This is done through branch and group meetings, hosting conferences and engagements with interested persons. However, this doesn't mean that we're always in an office having discussions. We also do activities together and encourage dialogue regarding global safety practice and culture. These are photos of activities with the international branches and the relationship managers that I have worked with. There's collaboration from places like UAE, Singapore, Oman, Qatar, just to name a few. I also gained a new appreciation for my relationship managers when I was able to witness firsthand all the work that they put into planning events and strategizing initiatives. Through this collaboration, friendships were forged. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my international um, colleagues for tuning in and supporting me in this webinar. So influence positive change and strengthen our impact globally through sharing of knowledge and learning. The most impactful opportunity was being able to participate in the ISO PC283 workshop, which was hosted in Trinidad to develop the second draft of the ISO 45001 standard, which specifies the requirements for an occupational safety and health management system. I was also involved in the planning and execution of the IOSH Caribbean Branch 2018 Safety and Health Conference where our main goal was to provide a forum to share best practice in occupational safety and health. The success of this conference in the Caribbean branch, the IOSH Excellence Award in 2019 under the Influence Grant.
That is a very proud achievement. So volunteering has many benefits. It allows for continuous professional development. This helped me to maintain and enhance knowledge and skills I needed to deliver professional services of superior, of superior quality to my company. It connected me to professionals around the globe. It helped me to understand how intangible aspects um, related to occupational safety and health and its management, such as varying cultures. It also offers that feeling of self-satisfaction. It gives me a, a sense of purpose that I am doing my part to make the world a safer place. It definitely adds to my professional growth by practicing important skills that are needed in the workplace, such as teamwork, project planning, problem solving, even organization and task management. These are attributes that are often overlooked that are crucial in job advancement in any company. So I encourage you to go out there, volunteer, give your time, and you will see that it's very beneficial. You will grow and it will make you happier. So back to you, James. Thank you. Maria, outstanding. Thank you very much. Um, for your, your examples are very inspiring uh, of how active a member of IOSH and volunteering that is for you. Your expertise more wildly will help a lot of others. And I think this really illustrates um, well how you can not only enhance your own prospects, but also be a, a great ambassador for this profession worldwide. And, and I mean that, Ria, fantastic. Now I'd like to introduce Josh uh, for insights into the health and safety uh, jobs market and how you, can how you can invest in your career. Josh, please turn on your video and uh, please share your screen. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy, and, uh, and thank you all for, for joining today. Um, as has been explained, uh, the purpose of, uh, of my involvement really is to give a bit of an oversight of, uh, from a professional recruitment perspective, how we've, uh, we've dealt with and also seen uh, the impact that COVID-19 has had on, uh, uh, on the communities that we serve. Um, so a bit of, of an introduction firstly. Um, so I'm Josh Huggins. I'm a director of Principal People and also a founding trustee of Safety for Good. Um, for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, Principal People are a market leading uh, health and safety uh, and also environment and quality recruitment organisation. And we were established back in 1986 and have solely worked in this market since around 1990. So um, know the health and safety profession very well. Um, and Safety for Good, uh, Safety for Good is a, is a charity that was created um, by our managing director, Simon Bliss, um, really to raise the positive profile of the health and safety profession. Um, so I just want to sort of tell you a bit of a story about how that came to light um, and, um, and take you back to uh, how, how Safety for Good was established. So I think for us, um, when we, uh, I'm sure when we socialize like you, uh, are asked what we do for work, the first uh, groan that we have is when uh, we, we tell people that we work within recruitment. Um, but, but secondly, um, the next question that's generally asked is the sector that we operate within. And I suppose from our perspective, that's when uh, we talk about health and safety, that sometimes we see people's eyes glaze over and, uh, and they lose lose a bit of interest. And I think that's created by the, the negative impression of of health and safety within the media. Um, and for us, working in this space every single day, it's absolutely crucial that the positive profile of the profession is, is improved. And, um, and actually the, the great work that you as a community do to help and serve the communities that you work within is protected. So Safety for Good was established by, by Simon in conjunction with IOSH um, and a number of leaders uh, from a health and safety perspective in the UK. And uh, as you can see on the presentation, our mission is to improve the profile and we can do that through three main ways. So um, donating time to great causes, organisations uh, that are unable to fund a full time health and safety person. We look to donate people's time to give advice and guidance as to how they can do things uh, safely. Uh, we also have a mentoring program uh, like IOSH, where uh, mentoring young and new entrants into the profession. Uh, to, to, to really ensure that they can become the future leaders of tomorrow. 
Um, and lastly, and the most traditional way is to raise money for our portfolio of charities. And our charities that we've uh, we focused on have all uh, got that element of health and safety behind them um, to ensure that the money that we raise is put to good use. So um, I wanted to take you back to uh, the uh, sort of pre-COVID um, position that principal people were in and, um, and then to show you the impact that it's had on the recruitment market. So as an organisation, uh, we typically average between 25 to 35 new instructions for positions from our clients every single week. They can range from administrator type roles through to uh, global directors, um, but those numbers are fairly consistent. When uh, the impact of COVID started, um, which for us was around the 16th of March. And um, as you can see, between the 16th of March and Friday, the 22nd of May, which was a, a 10 week period, um, the amount of new vacancies that were registered with us dropped to 23 jobs. So a severe change for us. And um, I'm sure if any of you have been job seeking during this current climate, you've realized that it has become a lot more difficult. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we had the very unfortunate position that actually 12 offers that were made by clients of ours uh, with, were withdrawn during this COVID period, um, which despite the ethical and moral views um, and discussions that we had with those organisations, um, they, they stood to. Now, uh, we're delighted to say that we've been able to secure 50% of those candidates um, uh, that had offers um, withdrawn by clients new uh, opportunities and um, which have now started and we're working very hard to ensure that those other six individuals um, do find employment very quickly. But on a more positive note um, and since the 1st of July we have absolutely seen a change in the amount of opportunities that are that are live and, um, and since the 1st of July we've registered 30 new opportunities um, which uh, means that we're feeling a lot more confident and positive that we're able to provide the community with opportunities as we move out of COVID. But when we were in the depths of lockdown and uh, opportunities were few and far between, uh, we had to think um, collaboratively in conjunction with Safety for Good and IOSH as to what we could do for the community in order to provide some insight to what people were experiencing and, um, and, and people that were struggling to understand what to do and how to best advise their organisations. And we came up with an idea um, which we called Inside Safety. And the idea of Inside Safety was to survey a number of leaders within the profession across a range of different industry sectors. And in the background, also conduct a wider survey of uh, health and safety professionals across all, all industry sectors and levels to understand the impact it was having for them uh, and also the hints and tips that they could give to help others within the profession. Um, what we uh, ended up doing was focusing those into four key industry sectors that you can see on the, on the right of your screen. Um, so we created an infrastructure one, which focused around construction, utilities, the rail and energy sectors, a manufacturing and engineering, a public sector one, a not-for-profit, and then a, an overall corporate services one. Um, and um, I know that these slides are going to be shared with everybody um, following today, um, and uh, the link's available if you can click on the um, on the bullet point that is, is shown now uh, in order to register to receive that document and to read and hear the insights from, from those leaders. But I thought I would just summarise a few of the key outcomes that came from this, because I think there are a few that are very interesting for the industry um, to, to consider. So the first is um, more individuals that were surveyed felt that COVID-19 could result in positive recruitment opportunities within their organization rather than redundancies. So 21% of respondents felt that because of COVID, there would be opportunities to expand and grow their function rather than 16% who predicted or were already experiencing redundancies. More than three quarters of the respondents felt that the impact of COVID could positively impact the health and safety profession through the steps that individuals within the sector had taken in order to really boost organisational performance. Um, and I think from our perspective, we saw, we've seen this real shift uh, both from speaking with our candidates and also speaking with our executive client leaders. Health and safety has always had, um, wrongly in my opinion, a perception that it can be a blocker to business performance. But uh, through the times of COVID, I think that we've seen and we've had the feedback that uh, the health and safety individuals have been the driving force in getting people back to work and, and, 
operations uh, driving forward, which has been a real positive. Um, interestingly, and I think this is where we take the broader risk management perspective, but only 45% of people surveyed felt that COVID-19 was actually the biggest risk facing their organisation. And these statistics are from the middle of lockdown. So when COVID was um, extremely high profile within the media, uh, but I think when you consider the overall risk profile of organisations, especially those in high risk technical engineering type firms uh, or coma uh, with coma sites and process safety, actually the COVID risk was slightly less than the overall uh, was slightly less than the overall risk to the business. Um, from a recruitment perspective, one of the key things we wanted to understand was um, how this is going to impact the skill sets moving forward. Um, and it was quite clear to us that the more respondents focused on the behavioural competence of individuals rather than the technical competence. And I think especially in the current climate where people don't have the technical answers because we've in, in our lifetimes never been through something like this, actually individuals ability to interpret law um, and then create a clear and concise approach to an organization in order to how to deliver that is more important than actually knowing the technical competence so of course technical understanding is an absolute essential need for a health and safety professional but more important is the ability to translate that into tangible steps that a business can take so um the final thing I wanted to summarise with was from our perspective, some tips to improve and advance your career prospects. I think it's absolutely essential, um, and I know Jimmy's going to talk about this, but to utilise within your career a value-adding mentor. Um, Safety for Good provides this function. I know IOSH has this, this service as well, but really speaking with individuals who have been there, seen uh, the, the, the issues that you've seen and can uh, be a good sounding board is absolutely crucial to your career and I would recommend everybody to have a mentor within, within the health and safety profession. Um, as Ria spoke about, um, volunteering, getting real work experience, even if it's unpaid, really makes a big difference and from our perspective with clients, when candidates have done that off their own back, when they're making a career transition, it makes them a much more attractive individual to the organisation because it shows a proactivity um, that others may not have. So recommend highly volunteering for work experience or volunteering to, uh, to work with your membership body to, to, make, uh, to make as much impact for you as possible. And thirdly, uh, networking, sort of in line with the mentoring, but networking is absolutely crucial. You never know when you're going to get your next job and where that's going to come from. And the bigger your network and the more engaged you are with your network, opportunities can come from there. And I know of a number of people during this time who have been struggling and looking for work, have used old contacts to, to actually secure a new opportunity. Uh, of course, um, engaging with a number of specialist recruitment organisations um, is something that we would recommend. And not just ourselves, there's a number of other uh, excellent recruitment organisations that specialise in this space. And um, although I wouldn't recommend going to every single agency out there, I would certainly recommend that uh, two or three um, good relationships um, will pay dividends for you in the future. And um, through this period of time, we also created a, a video around developing your personal brand and, um, and that link is there for you to watch on our website, um, which um, is something there's lots of tips in there that would be good. Um, and finally, going back to the point that I mentioned from the survey, focusing on your behavioural competence is absolutely essential in this time rather than purely the technical side. And those four key um, behaviours that I've put there, I think are absolutely crucial to the new normal of a health and safety professional. So happy to, to talk about this and answer any questions, but um, thank you very much for your time. And uh, Jimmy, I'll pass back to you. Well, that was outstanding. Thanks very much, Josh. Uh, really, really informative uh, presentation. Uh, I think we all learn a lot and, and can be more confident in how we manage our careers and help organizations recover from the effects of the pandemic. Um, you are right, I indeed have three mentors. Uh, one is older and a former uh, past president of the institution. Uh, one is a long serving construction professional. And, and I have another mentor who's 20 years younger than me and works at the strategic level in our business here. Uh, and I learn something new every day. So that, again, thank you so much for that, Josh. Well, finally, I just wanted to reflect for a short while on, on what I've learned over the, the past 36 years and, and how my career journey has taken me from the massive challenges that I had then to new opportunities in Ocean. 
And many of these will inform my time as the IOS president from October this year. And a lot of these things I'm very, very passionate about. Um, but just to take you through a quick five minutes of what my life has was and, and where it's got to now. And I left school at 16 years of age. I left school on a Friday. I went to a, an open job fair. Um, and I had a, a C in classical studies. I had a C in home economics. And I had a D in art. And I met an amazing man who's one of the biggest hotel owners in the Scotland now, a man called William Costley. And uh, Bill Costley said to me, son, you're going to be a chef. You've got two amazing attributes there. You're obviously an artist and you're obviously a cook. Um, so there I became a chef and started more or less the following, the following Monday. And that took me from being in a place where I'd, I'd lived in a really rough area of, of Glasgow and, and then moved to a small country village. And I didn't really know a lot about teamwork. Okay, I'd played a little bit of rugby and I'd been a, quite a successful sportsman but in sprinting. And, and I learned what intensity was, I learned what teamwork was, uh, and I learned um, how, how to work in a pressure, a real pressure environment. And anybody that's worked in a kitchen and done a split shift um, will know what that's all about. It's, it's an amazing, um, hard-working um, area, and, and I missed it for a long time. But I had a calling, and, and, and I think that calling took me to the Army. I took, went to the Army at 18, and the first thing, I just couldn't believe what I'd done. You know, I, so this will make a lot of you laugh and picture me now with my short hair, but at, at 18 years of age, I had lovely long locks and I had a lovely perm at the back and a bronze streak through my hair. Um, I was a new romantic. I loved all those, all that music. And the first thing that happened was it all got shaved off. And so that just brought me down to a bump to what I was going to do. But what I didn't know at that time was that to be in the army, you have to be broken like a wild style, stallion, so to speak. You you have to conform to a way of thinking, um, process, procedure. You learn a lot about respect and a lot about trust. And and that was probably one of my hardest things uh, for me um, was that trust, those trust issues um, when I came out because I'd left my family. So the 24 years that I was in the army um, were absolutely amazing because I learned lots and lots about a lot of things, a lot of people, a lot of countries, a lot of cultures, and, and it made me the person that I am today, uh, that person who's, who, who trusts, that person who is loyal, respectful, and, and, and all those words that we talk about in terms of the, what's health and safety don't mean so much to me in terms of the health and safety that we know. Words like loyalty, respect, trust, um, ownership, reflection. Those are the words that mean the most to me about all that we do. So in terms of that then, what else happened? Well, I joined the army, as I said, but I had to leave sort of 24 years later. And when I left, I found myself a little bit lost. And But before I left the army, I found that I had this sort of transition into instruction. So I thought, what could I do? Um, I took some advice and I thought, well, I'm going to get into sort of teaching health and safety. So I learned about it, read books, very academic, not so much practical. And I started teaching some IOSH courses to start. And that's what really started getting me thinking into IOSH. And from that, I got picked up and got asked if I would um, like to become a um, health and safety uh, advisor. And I said to my manager that took me on, I said, what does a health and safety advisor do? He said, well, I don't know. You advise health and safety. Just go out and talk to people. Now, talking to people was something I could do quite well. And those soft skills or power skills you get from the army, those decision-making skills, that ability to, to go into a team and form a team, it became very, very easy to me. I thought it was going to be very, very difficult. But in fact, it was quite easy. The only bad thing and the hard thing for me, which was a silly thing to do, was to leave the army and cut everything off. So a family that I'd had for 24 years, I moved away from straight away and thought I could do it all on my own. And, and that was a big mistake. So anyone that's on this call that, 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 that is a veteran that's thinking about getting into this area of work, don't cut the ties. Keep those ties well and truly secure. Because I was lucky. When I joined IOSH and I went to the South Coast branch, there was a lot of veterans there. And the chair at the time, Andy, he, he, he was a, a veteran of the Royal Engineers. And 
I, I then started to get back into those branches and groups and and I was to be all the count. I don't want to get too emotional about it. Saved me at that time. They really gave me an understanding of I've left one massive family. Hi, I'm in another massive family. A family that has forty eight thousand, you know, people worldwide, and and that's where I wanted to go. So just before I sort of finish, the one thing that I would judge everybody to do in terms of going back to um, um, both. Uh, Ria and going straight back to Josh as well is those two things were good for me. The volunteering. If you're a member of IOS, get out there, volunteer and try and volunteer as much as you can, but don't too, do too much. Remember, it's a volunteering thing. And Josh, all those things he was talking about by the, 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 the recruiting side of things, you know, get out there and, 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 and try and establish yourself in even as a volunteer, even if you have to go and work for someone where you have to learn things. I, I did it for nearly two years before I left the army to, to build my CV. So all the things that Josh and Weir have said, I have actually done. And, and I can, I'm, I'm sitting here now talking to you as an ex-president of IOS. So what are the main opportunities I see as the IOS president in a COVID world? Well, managing the risk of this pandemic is going to be something that we're all going to have to keep an eye on. And and looking at the risk of that and building a safer, healthier working world. But the main thing for me in terms of this is having this opportunity now to reach out to you, to, to speak to a lot of you, and, and also to engage with as many people as possible. This is a wonderful platform. Does that take away that I hope COVID disappears and is near the future as possible so I can go out and speak to people and see people and, and meet them face to face? Of course it does. But in the meantime, um, Watch this space uh, and watch from October. The presidential team are going to be everywhere. They're going to be very, very approachable, and as they are now. And I'm really looking forward to taking over uh, from Andrew in late October. So enough of me. Um, let's uh, go into some Q&A then. So some Q&A. Let's go into the first one. Uh, if I can come to you straight away, um, Josh. Um, there was a, a great question, and I've missed it now, um, from Mike, uh, Mike Campbell. Um, so as a new professional, how do you offer your services if you don't have the required experience? Other organisations that allow you to do this, Josh, I think you're going to be straight on there. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's um, uh, it's it, it, it goes back to the point of, of gaining that uh, volunteering experience as much as possible um, without... Uh, without the experience, I understand it's very difficult for people who are making the transition into the industry to um, to be seen and and for CVs to be um, to be sort of understood and uh, and to give you that chance. But therefore, that's why we do highly recommend the the, the volunteering, unpaid volunteering, um, uh, networking to create those opportunities. I think it's difficult without a relationship with someone to just sort of send your CV in, be given a, given a chance. But if you network, if you attend your IOF branch meetings or um, engage with the recruitment organizations, I think it will give you the opportunity to build a relationship with someone, get some, get some uh, work experience, um, and, um, and, and, and then I suppose it's down to you to really prove yourself. But it, 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 is, it is a challenge, um, but hopefully, um, if you if you follow those steps, you can you can be successful. Wonderful, Josh. Thanks, thanks very much, mate. Um, I've got another question here for 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 you. Uh, well, not another question. I've got a question for you, uh, Ria, and I think it's something that you may be able to help with. Um, I've just lost it. I did have it. Um, oh, here's a nice one. A nice uh, a nice one for you, Ria. I'm impressed and always have been with the extent and spread of Ria's volunteerism. Well done. So here we go. Um, okay, from uh, I think this is Angels or Angels, our okay, it's for Uria. We see when Michael comes from um, as he's found himself in a position to volunteering for work experience, but find it's a difficult option. Um, mentoring is a great option, and the volunteering of those who are already working in the field to help the ones that want to get into it to make a good answer. Oh, it wasn't a question; it was a statement. Apologies. Um, I'm coming back to you. I, I, I apologise, uh, Josh. Which sector, construction, process, oil and gas, etc., and health and safety is better suited for career growth? Question 1A. What factors should one consider when selecting which sector to pursue, either academically or professionally? 
Josh? Yeah, I think I think that's a good question. Uh, it's I suppose the sector the, the sector that you choose um, should really be a personal preference um, that you that you want to get involved in. Um, my recommendation with regards to qualifications would always be to be as broad as possible. Um, if you go specifically with your qualifications, it may limit the ability for you to be seen by organisations, especially again, if we go back to the CV. Um, so being broad with your qualifications, if you can go for a more general type of qualification rather than a specific industry one, I would, I would recommend you do that. Um, but the sector, um, I mean, there's obviously sectors that are growing and there's sectors that aren't growing, but I would, I would sort of put it down to people's personal um, personal preference for the sectors that you really want to get involved with. And if there's a sector that, that really interests you and excites you, then I think you may have more passion for it. It may mean you come across better and therefore you're more successful. Um, but of course, there are sectors that have been heavily hit um, by COVID and, um, and it's difficult to make a transition into a sector like that when, of course, it's facing job losses and redundancies. So I think um, that uh, in kind of in summary, Personal preference um, would be what I would say in terms of sector. Obviously, be, be mindful of the current climate. But in terms of the qualifications, try to be as broad as possible. Until you get into a specific sector that you know you want to be in for the rest of your life, then, of course, it would be, be worthwhile specialising. Brilliant. Well, I think that hopefully, Ramakrishnan, uh, that's, that's given a good answer for you. And if you want to follow up another question with that answer from Josh, uh, please let us know. Ria, a question from me to you. Um, we've known each other sort of through Twitter. We've never actually met over the last few years, Twitter and LinkedIn and, and, and different webinars when I jumped in and out. When I was the vice president in the Middle East, I was given a, a sort of task by uh, our then president, Craig Foyle, to, to reach out and try and pull the branches together. Um, what, what is it that actually brought you to, to the volunteering side? Had you volunteered before? Uh, before you started work, it's always been part of your life. The main reason that I went into volunteering was to build my portfolio. I was employed in the human resources sector and it was very routine. I, I wanted a change and uh, that's why I pursued a degree in occupational safety and health. But when I realized that I wasn't getting employment because I didn't have experience. I started to volunteer with organizations that had an impact in one way or the next with health and safety. For instance, with um, the ODPM and the Red Cross of Trinidad and Tobago, their focus is on disaster relief. Um, there are bits and pieces of occupational safety and health in there uh, with regard to the the Red Cross, um, for this COVID-19 situation, we were trained as contact tracers and that was very insightful and it was very self-fulfilling as well because I felt I was able to contribute um, and give back to this situation that nobody has seen before. Everybody's in a panic and, you know, we want some type of reassurance that we're managing the situation well. It's, we, we have things under control. Um, so it's, it's course, nice. So those skills that you learned through volunteering, you then developed in your job. And now through your job, you've now came back out, you're still volunteering and you're, and you're using all the stuff that volunteering initially gave you before you developed more. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Yes. That's wonderful. Um, brilliant, Ria. Um, I just, I just got one here from a, a, you know, uh, someone I know, actually. We did a post together back in the day. I absolutely agree with Josh on the mentor statement. Uh, through Safety for Good, I managed to get a great mentor to help me make that step into a board-level position. And, and I, don't, I don't think I am Alex's mentor. So I, oh, I'm a bit shocked for that statement, but we'll let that one go. Um, he'll give me a hard time later. Um, here we go. Here's a great question, Josh. Uh, and you'll be able to come in on this one possibly as well, Ria. And we were talking about this, if you remember, yesterday. Matt, this is bang on the question I hope would come up. It's from Mike Watson, and it's, I need some, oh, no, wrong one. No, that's a different one. Um, there we go. It's from Melissa Mark. You are seeing more comments about the increasing value of behavioral competence relative to the technical competence 
but how is this identified during a view of CVs to shortlist candidates? Melissa, I put Josh in the spot yesterday and asked a very, very question. Over to you, Josh. Yes, yeah, it's a very good question. And I think the first part of the answer that I gave to Jimmy yesterday, which um, I'd like to reiterate is, your CV is, um, the, the, what is your purpose of your CV is a question that we, we, ask, we ask people. Because I think most people in the back of their mind feel that their CV is the thing that's going to get them the job. The CV is the thing that's going to get you an interview. And uh, you have to make sure that you're clear about that and therefore tailor it to, uh, to that. It's very difficult in a CV to explain and show and highlight your behavioural competence. I, I understand. And that's why um, we look at um, always including key achievements in your CV. Um, if you can paint in a very short and concise way uh, what the situation was, how you dealt with it, um, and the tangible result that you created, um, it's very, very powerful. However, of course, in a CV, you do need to be clear and concise. Um, it's one of the reasons, actually, why at Principal People, we're uh, looking to utilise a lot more around video interviewing technology. And as part of our shortlist presentation now to clients, we're not just providing the CV, but also um, short interview, uh, interview clippets that we can send to the client, which can show and demonstrate people's behavioural competence. But um, I think being clear and concise in your CV, talking about your behavioural competence, um, is important, but of course, at the interview stage is the most important thing to demonstrate that in, in the most possible way. So I think from my perspective, that's what I would say. Yeah, and I, I absolutely uh, concur, Josh, that, that 100%, and uh, I know you and I are quite passionate about exactly that. Ria, I've got a great question for you here. It's come from Ralph in the other court. How do you manage to balance volunteering alongside a full-time job? That's a good question, James. Um, for me, I think the important thing is time management, um, you know, manage your, and, and having balance. So you would want to make sure that your work objectives are met and you have whatever projects you're working on through volunteering. It's, you know, you, you pencil sufficient time to address those. Fantastic. I hope that answers that. that. Fantastic question. Um, now, I've got a question here from me. Um, just quite from David Bedo. I attended a virtual coffee morning this morning uh, with the president Andrew Sharman. Are you going to commit to do the same even after things get back to normal that will allow you to meet and engage with members? Absolutely, David. Um, if you don't know anything about me, um, you cut me in half and you see IOSH members, branches, groups, and that's uh, global. I'll be everywhere. I'll be doing as much as I can, 100%. Uh, so thank you very much for that question and uh, thanks for answering, asking it. Uh, I've got a couple of just statements here that I'll go through while we're giving you a bit of time to rest your brains from those questions. Um, uh, okay, we'll come back to that one in a moment. Um, oh, another good one. Um, <laughs> agreed with you, James. Oh, here we go from uh, Catherine. Um, Agree with you, James. Soft skills are a key requirement for an OSH professional. Listening skills, being able to talk to people, team working. I'm also pleased to see from Josh that employers are looking at the behavioural competencies. People can learn the technical skills. Good presentation today. So well done, both. Um, we've got a master student in Cyprus called Quincy. Josh, he's finding it, diff they're finding it difficult to find a mentor. Um, those in the UK reply that they can't mentor because of the distance, which I... I can't understand. I'm sure if you get in touch with um, Josh, he'll be able to maybe lead you or be able to get you some, somewhere on that one. For sure, if yeah. Not, if not, if you're an IOS member, um, we'll definitely look after you. Um, oh, cool. Great one, Ria. Ria, do you think your work organisation appreciates your volunteerism, even they, if they even know? And if they do know, are you supported? <laughs> Brilliant. Great question. <laughs> That's another good question, James. Um, yes, my organization do know about my volunteering and they are very supportive. I think that they're, they're proud that I'm spending time to do additional, additional things that are not purely organization based, but the organization also gets recognized when I'm doing initiatives because I do represent the company so it's they're very supportive 
um, they're very encouraging as well. And yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely know and they're, they're Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Brilliant. Um, look, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just rushing through a little bit. Um, Andrew Douglas. Hi, James. I did 23 years of health health and safety by accident, but struggle with seeing it as a real job with purpose, especially when it feels like banging my head against the wall, not getting the same feeling of teamwork as I did in the army. Listen, uh, on that quick one, uh, Andrew, I, one of the reasons why I went to the Middle East was to, to, to be able to understand that banging the head against the wall feeling because things are not done very quickly out there. Um, you never had the luxury of a mentor for guidance. I just dig in, but find it hard. Any tips? Yes. Get on the mentor website, for IOSH, by my name, ask me, and I'll mentor you. No problems at all. Okay, one for you, Josh. Should OSH professionals seek to expand, I think you, you talked a little bit this in your presentation, seek to expand their competence into wider risk management in light of COVID-19 experience, where from my own experience, organizations are seeking wider knowledge and skill sets. And IOSH already talking about that. So over to you on that one, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is a this is a great point that uh, is a hot topic of conversation with clients at the moment, especially at a senior le at a senior level. And I, um, I would assume that the individual that's asked that is is probably um, a, a, a bit more strategic, perhaps, because um, we're seeing um, the sort of metaphoric glass ceiling um, that health and safety individuals can go to can be limited if um, if there's no diversity no, no diversity in their in their skill set. Um, because organisations are quite quick to pigeonhole health and safety individuals within a particular function. But risk management is a much broader topic. And there's been some great examples of individuals who have um, uh, transformed their, uh, their careers through health and safety into broader enterprise risk management. Um, I know Ruth Denyer, um, who's the um, now, uh, I believe, the chief risk officer or um, director of risk for ITV, who's a trustee of Safety for Good, um, has been through that journey um, and it's a fantastic journey to go because it broadens the scope it gives you wider responsibility um, it improves your career and actually it's um, there's, there's, there's more interesting things to come from risk and actually health and safety individuals have such a good grasp of risk because it's because it's what you do that it can be applied to other areas of the business so I absolutely think that organizations will not only want that but start to demand that from health and safety professionals and pleased to hear that I assure doing their bit to encourage um, individuals to do that. But absolutely, I think broader risk management is the way that health and safety profession will go. Thank you, Josh. Have you got anything to add to that, Ria? Would you like to add anything to that question? Um, I think Josh summed it up in Sweden. Okay, good, good. Um, so here's one uh, from uh, Louise Hosking, one of our fantastic vice presidents. Um, Many OSH professionals start in another area of their business. They may find themselves gradually moving into OSH, perhaps from a business support role. Would you like to add anything to that, Austria, before I go to Josh? Sure. Um, so after, after I finished school, I wasn't sure what field I wanted to go to. It was that dilemma. So automatically, well, here I tend, tend to move towards administration and human resources. So that's where I started my career. And after a while, it's, you know, you, you've seen it all. It's not really a challenge. Um, I was using my passion and um, the Occupational Safety and Health Act had just passed in Trinidad and there was a need for safety professionals. So that is the reason that I moved towards um, academically and move towards um, getting qualifications. And um, I'm, I'm very committed to the health and safety course. I'm very enthusiastic. I definitely have the passion. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm very happy that I'm, that I'm in this field. It's, Fantastic. It's, I, think, I think the reason why Louise was asking that question, so I know Louise quite well, um, is that uh, Louise moved from a, an environmental health role that she did for many years and then created her own business, a very successful business. Um, and, and that's why she feels as well that there's a lot to be gained by different areas of, of that as well, which is great. Josh, would you like to come in and reply, please? Yeah, I think that it's um, absolutely true. Uh, we see it, um, I think in the most mature organisations, it works so well. Um, organisations that have very good succession planning 
when the director is going to move on, the head of the head of safety perhaps will step up and it will create a chain reaction of individuals moving through. So the organizations can actually just focus on recruiting talent at that um, sort of coordinator advisor type level. And, um, and for the, for the real um, most mature organizations, that's through internal, internal moves within the business. So we see internal moves from administration, operations, HR, um, a, a wide variety of different skill sets. But if the organization has that, uh, growth trajectory within the health and safety function, it's seen as a function that adds value, then um, it's a great career choice for people. And I think it it's, should be encouraged. Okay, fantastic, brilliant. Um, David, uh, apologies, that was me uh, that was going through the, the question. So your question is going to come up now. Um, Josh, I think this one's for you. Uh, he said, not sure on my question about how we might change, how we might deliver services dismissed. Happy ever to engage in a debate another time. Enjoy the webinar. Apologies, David. Um, that was me with my... I should have just let Ben go through the question. So if you'd like to put your question back in, I'll make sure it's answered in the next um, eight minutes. Hopefully you haven't left. Um, for Josh, uh, when including key achievements on your CV... This is from Catherine Horsell. Um, yes. When... Keeps moving. Here we go. Uh, when including key achievements on your CV, it is seen as being acceptable to include personal achievements as well as professional, for example, if you built your own home. A question. There are many transferable skills that can be learned, developed. Is, are some of these things achievable that we achieve personally, but not, might not be suitable to include in our CV? So what do, you, what do you do on a personal level, all that sort of thing? I think that's what Kathy's trying to do. Sure. So, I mean, I would always recommend that the key highlights of your CV are focused on your work career because of course that's what most employers will look for and especially if the CV isn't going through a recruitment company but straight to an HR department um, that might be screened out as unnecessary information but um, what we look to do as, as recruiters um, is obviously get under the skin of, of a candidate and, and into into their CV so I think it's good to have a few personal things for sure I mean we always recommend personal interests and um, as long as it's um, it's, there's, it's it's summarized well um, and if there's some health and safety outcomes from those things that you've learned or things that you feel are transferable to your career, then of course, include them, but just make sure it's clear, concise um, and relevant to what it is that you're applying for and always try to get that link back in some right. capacity. Okay, Josh, I hope that, hopefully that, that helped. Um, I'm just going to, what I'm going to do, I hope that helped Catherine. I'm short and sharp now because we've got about six minutes left. Um, so here's, a, here's another one for you. Some tips for updating my CV from Josh will be great. Yep. How would they do that? Um, you, for sure. Very quickly, I think if, you, if I mean, get in touch with us and um, send your CV into us. Um, one of the team would be happy to help. Um, but I think um, on the presentation um, that I put the link to, there's something about how to create a good CV. Um, and, um, and I think that would be the best thing to follow rather than trying to explain over 30 seconds. Oh, fantastic. David's come back in. Have the current restrictions, sorry, David Newsom, have the current restrictions presented the potential for a real sea change in how we advise, consult, and train? Can we do a lot more remotely and therefore at lower cost than we might previously have wanted to admit? You've got 30 seconds, Ria. I missed that question. Okay, I'll let Josh go first. Josh? Um, I mean, I, I think from the insights that we took from Inside Safety, um, that's absolutely something that people are looking at. I mean, I think that the cost may come from the technology that you need to utilize in order to have the coverage that you need. Um, but I know that there's a number of different things of technology that are being developed in order to allow people to be less present on site. And um, there's positives and negatives for it, like with any technology change. But I think it should be explored before it's dismissed. Fantastic. Do you have anything to add? No. No, I think it's um, it's just exactly as you just said, Josh, and that needs to happen. David, um, you've got another question, which is great. What advice would you give to someone on grad IELTS thinking about taking a leap to member? Do it. And um, and if you want any advice, you can drop me a line at james.quinn at iosh.com, double N. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you as well. No problems at all. Right. Just uh, literally a couple of minutes left. Let's go through some statements. Um, yeah, we've got that one from David. Good. Um, how many job descriptions are you seeing that want ISO standards, Josh? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I would probably say the majority 
make reference to it um, for, for ISO standards, but the, normally the phrase that's always included as well is or equivalent. So if there's other standards that you've worked to, um, of course, they generally follow similar principles. And so we would always speak to clients to, uh, to ask them to uh, consider individuals that perhaps if they haven't worked with a particular ISO standard, that they've worked with other standards, they can learn that. Again, it goes back to the thing, if the behavior's right, the technical skills we believe in most instances can be learned unless it's a very specific technical need. Okay, fantastic, mate. I'm just, I know I'm rushing you. And um, Josh, you've got, you've got about 30 seconds on this one, but I'm going to ask you the question and I'm going to go to Ria. Okay, so Josh, uh, I'm, going to ask, I'm going to ask you the question, I want you to think about it and I'm going to go to Ria for a question. Fine. Josh, this is from Deborah. That last one was from Kenneth Driscoll, by the way. This question is from Deborah uh, Wordsworth. Josh, could I ask you to be more specific about your clients are looking for regards soft skills for role application? Having undertaken mental health suicide awareness training in the past, there is no specific competence training for safety professionals that I know of to provide competency in this field. I don't know if you'll be able to ask it, ask it, Josh, but have a think. Okay. okay, Ria, how much value do potential employers attach to a CV when they see voluntary experience for you? Did your voluntary experience help you um, on your CV and, and did you put it on your CV to start with? And that was from Darren Root. Oh, good question. So yes, I do. 30 seconds. I do include my volunteering experience in my CVs and I think it's very impactful and it has helped me land jo jobs that I have, that I was interested in. Good. And that, that, that voluntary experience you did, was that uh, general or was it as a voluntary to your industry before you got into the industry? This would be both um, beneficial to soft skills and technical skills. Soft skills like team working, collaboration, things like that, and technical skills like policy writing um, and development. Fantastic, Ria. Uh, wonderful. Darren, I hope that's helpful. Josh, are you ready? Yep, ready. Right, I, think, go, I think that with regards to um, uh, the soft skills, it's, it's very difficult to get those through on your role application. I, mean, I, I put up four behavioural competence that um, I think are uh, key for any safety professional to have around sort of coaching, stakeholder engagement, um, dealing with challenges, having flex flexibility and adaptability. And as I said before, if you can try, if you can try to encourage uh, examples of that in your CV of when that's happened without writing uh, war and peace then you're going to be able to stand out but again if you can meet with a recruiter or have a video call with them a video call with the client directly you're able to show that and i think when you showcase it of course it, it stands you in much better stead fantastic i think i've just gone through them all now um wonderful 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 okay just a final point from Haley. right thank you Haley. this has been really helpful and i agree that volunteering is really useful for professional development there you go ria so thank you for that. I'm on the IOS Future Leaders Community Steering Group. Wonderful, Haley. In fact, I think I've met you. If I haven't met you, I think I know you um, for this year. And so far, I've got a lot out of it and built some great networks and relationships. Haley, I am absolutely passionate about the, the, the Future Leaders Group. And I believe that, um, I, I probably a spoiler alert, but I believe that one of our amazing vice presidents, um, Mr. Hughes, is going to be, Stuart Hughes, that is, is going to be hopefully speaking at one of your conferences. And I will be there as well to talk to anyone that's there. Future leaders, fantastic. Okay, on that point then, we've got about a minute left. Um, all I want to say to both of you before I hand over to Ben is uh, absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for your time. Um, both of you um, in different ways in the things that you're doing. I've, I've given a lot to this over 200 people that have come into this webinar today. And um, what I want to just let everybody know is that this, these webinars take place every Thursday, so keep an eye on them. And I'm just going to hand over in a moment now to Ben. But I'd just like to say, Josh, thank you very much, Leah, outstanding, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Simon, uh, for the support. And thanks again so much to, to Ben for doing this. And uh, I'm going to give Sunita Patel a mention because she's always looking after me. Thanks all.